icon. Ta da! And get rid of myself. There. Okay. Welcome once again. Good to see you all. Glad to be together. I invite us to just take a moment to breathe and to say an opening blessing, which is our way of of creating this sanctuary space for ourselves, or let's say study space for ourselves. Please join me. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. This week uh, is the end of the Book of Numbers. We've reached the last parasha, Parashat Masai, and with that we conclude the the remarkable, extraordinary journey of the children of Israel through the wilderness, and especially uh, tune in to the experience, the leadership experience, the challenges, and the you know victories uh, that Moses has experienced in his his position, and. Very quickly, we'll turn the page, or I guess scroll the scroll, and we'll be in a new book of the Torah, Devarim, which, as we know, is a, a kind of um, recounting of the entire journey. Uh, Moses' long, long farewell speech in which he attempts over and over again to highlight the most important uh, I was thinking, Shlomo, of what you were saying before about the word lekach you know, the most important takeaways for the children of Israel to hold on to uh, as since he knows that he won't be journeying forth with them. I'd like to do something a little different today, N not actually to study from Parashat Masai with you. Um, I think it has its own, its own interesting lessons to teach us, its own interesting questions to raise for us as, as the entire Torah does but instead to turn today to the prophetic texts of the three weeks. These three weeks between the 17th of Tammuz and the 9th of Av. So the 17th of Tammuz, uh, which was observed uh, a Sunday ago, not this past Sunday, but the week before, which is designated in Jewish history as the date when the walls of Jerusalem were breached. So it's not the final destruction, but perhaps the beginning of the actual siege and destruction of Jerusalem. And then uh, being especially tuned in during these three weeks leading up to the 9th of Av, to Tisha B'Av, of this season of <clears throat> uh, unfathomable loss and trauma. Um, interested in looking with you today at some of the central verses from the prophet Jeremiah, whose, uh, whose words we traditionally read in the synagogue during these weeks. I'm not including the last of the three haftarot, which is from Isaiah. The last one is Shabbat Chazon, the, the, uh, the, the, in this case it'll be the morning of Tisha B'Av uh, this year, which is, it's, it's, it's got its own special place in the lectionary, the lectionary meaning sort of the schedule of reading and its own unique messages and its own unique language. But for the first two of the three weeks, we, we read from Jeremiah. So I have some, uh, actually a lot of Jeremiah to look at with you and to just talk through together and learn together. And I'd like to start uh, just by trying to say a few words about the way I think we're meant to read the prophetic texts, um, which is to say it's a window on our history as a people. It's not, uh, obviously, it's not history um, composed in the way we're taught as modern Western people to read history. We're taught to read history, hopefully, as as factual as possible, as dispassionate as possible. In fact, we're taught that that's a central value of reading history, that it's supposed to be without bias. And we look for those authors who can help us learn 
as much as we can uh, from that standpoint. And we have to juxtapose that with our tradition, which presents its history to us in a most uh, heartfelt, poetic, in many cases, biased way. Uh, so it's an opportunity to see into what it was that our ancestors were experiencing, what it was that they perhaps wanted us, if they could have imagined us sitting here, you know, almost 2,000 years later, what it was that they wanted us to know or to feel. And so that some of that is what has to be, you know, uh, baked into our prescription lenses as we read from, in this case, Jeremiah, this prophet who as we'll see in a moment, who struggled so deeply with his role as a prophet and who was called into prophecy at a most catastrophic time for the Jewish people. So what, what a job he had. In a moment, I'll pull up the, the sheet that I've put together for us today, which is gonna begin with a little bit of uh, writing from the, the marvelous teacher in our time, Erica Brown, we're going to begin and end with Erica Brown today. That's my intention, at least. Uh, starting with some commentary that she has about this season in general and the importance of knowing our history. So with that, let me just go ahead and, and bring that up for us. Uh, and let's see, will it be here? Not yet. Hold on. Let me just... Share screen here. Okay. Uh, so this week is simply called three weeks because here we are in the midst of these three weeks. If I do that, will these things go away? Yes. Okay, so this is from the introduction of Erica Brown's book called In the Narrow Places, which is a wonderful book that she wrote just for this season, just for these three weeks. And she does a a very elegant job, as I find her to do in general, of describing the challenge of observing these three weeks, of living in a time when in secular culture there's not much support for staying focused here. Um, and yet at the same time, ah, so bear with me just a second. There's one other thing I really wanted to say um, in, in my introduction about the relationship between the Torah and Haftarah texts in this season. So Erica's focus here is to to um, support us in observing this season in whatever ways we can and acknowledging that we live in a culture even modern Israeli culture uh, you know even in a Jewish state where it's just not that um, intuitive to be in a in a place of national mourning during this time we'd frankly rather be at the beach uh, at least I know I would um, but what I wanted just to ask you to also kind of hold in your consciousness is the interesting way that the Jewish calendar sort of pulls away from the weekly Torah lectionary at this time in some ways, and in some ways reinforces it. So, you know, normally for most of the year, we're in a steady rhythm. We call the Shabbatot by their Torah parasha. So, you know, Shabbat Balak, Shabbat, you know, Matot even. Uh, this week, by the way, this week the diaspora Jewish community and the Israeli Jewish community will reconverge. So anybody who's been walking around going, wait a minute, why are they all reading this and we're reading that? This is the Shabbat that we all come back together and then go forward together into the new year. Yeah, what a relief. But the emphasis on history is borne out through the texts that we read. So the emphasis on history is to say, actually, we're going to pull away a little bit from the regular focus on the end of numbers here. And we're still going to read the end of numbers in the synagogue. But in our Haftarot, we're going to focus instead on this uh, turning point in Jewish history, really uh, cataclysmic, catastrophic, and also uh, really a turning point in Jewish history. Okay, I've said enough. Let me now go ahead and pull up the... Um, here. Okay. Um, Barb Richmond, would you be willing to start us off here? Can you see this okay? 
Yes. Okay. So this is, again, just from Erica Brown's introduction to her book about the three weeks. There was a time when it was important to know the place you came from in the broadest sense, to have a master narrative of a people as a bedrock for your own values. It grounded you and gave you direction. If you knew where you came from, you argu arguably have a better sense of where you're going. Tishba'av is best observed by those who appreciate history and understand that a nation must look back if it is to look forward. Examining the vicissitudes and errors of the past helps you correct them in the future. Cicero, the renowned Roman statesman and orator once said, to remain ignorant of things that happened before you were born is to remain a child. There is an immaturity about individuals who have no grip on history. There is an immaturity about nations that have disregarded the past and only look at the present and to the future. Great, thank you, so beautifully read. Okay, so just some, I think some helpful language about the importance of knowing our history which is really at the core of these texts that we're going to read. And again, you know, history rendered through the pen or the quill or whatever, you know, implement they were using of a prophet and a poet in this case. So a different kind of reading history, but still it's the, the, ultimate, uh, the ultimate point is to connect us with this history. Okay, and then a little bit later in the introduction, Barb, do you, would you continue here? Sure. Thank you. Um, suffering hu humanizes us. Ignoring suffering dehumanizes us. I don't want to ruin my good mood by looking at that homeless person, so I turn away. And with that turning, I let go of my social responsibility to him or her. Mm -hmm. Attunement to suffering makes us more compassionate. It also helps us appreciate where we come from and all that it took to get us to where we are. We have to remind ourselves that we don't diminish our happiness when we spend a day or a few weeks meditating on the tragedies of history from which we emerged. We become more grateful, holding on tightly to our blessed lives because we can. Okay, pause here for a second, thank you. So I don't know about you all, but I can't help but hear through Barb's wonderful reading here, just look at the struggle that's going on in this country, in the United States of America, about how we relate to our history, the struggle that's going on right now, right in, right in the news right now, and about our, our national you know, resistance towards learning and highlighting and sort of exploring some of the darkest, the most uh, dark and uh, terrible parts of our history. And of course, the, her point is without doing that, we remain in this immature place. Um, and certainly the Jewish people even for all of our focus on history, we still have our own growing up to do. So we're not, um, we're not excusing ourselves from that developmental task. Okay, um, let me just pause here and see any thoughts or anything any of you wanna say just about this part so far before we go on. Yeah, go ahead, Barb, go ahead. I'm really struck by in the first paragraph talking about knowing where you are and where you come from because there is so much in Matot and Maase. Mm -hmm. um, it almost reads like a mapping exercise. Yes. Um, I'm, you know, I'm going from here, I'm camping here, and then I'm Correct. going here and I'm going here. And Correct. then there's the whole, what city are you in and how you set up the city and here are the, mm -hmm. the boundaries and the limits. Yep. So what I'm seeing in her first paragraph is really an echo of what's in the Torah portions. Yes, beautiful, thank you. Uh, Bob, go ahead. I just, um, my reaction is, you know, in that second paragraph, read, reading um, suffering humanizes us. Mm -hmm. um, it just um, kind of makes me shudder to hear that. I understand she's using a rhetorical device to make a point, mm. um, but um, uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, whatever she's saying there could have been said in a different way. It's almost as if, um, you know, we need to have suffering in order to human or be more ourselves or, you know, sympathizing with people who are suffering doesn't mean that, um, you know, it's a requirement of our lives or a requirement for our children that they 
they suffer. It just um, struck me wrong. I'd rather it was put a different way. Yeah, I, I it's it's a conundrum, isn't it? We don't want any and of our loved ones. We don't want anyone to suffer. I mean, not just our loved ones, but well, maybe certain past presidents. I would say they could stand some suffering. Okay, Shlomo, go ahead, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily agree that suffer, suffering humanizes us. Mm -hmm. And I think humility is that which will lead to our being open to recognize the suffering of others. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that being humble humanizes us and leads to us to be able to view and suffer with others who are suffering. Mm -hmm. Okay, point well taken. Let's keep going. This is meant to be just introductory uh, to get us to Jeremiah. So maybe another reader now, just this last part from Erica Brown. Anybody? Shlomo, go ahead. To quote Cicero again, history is the witness that testifies to the passing of time. It illumines reality, vitalizes memory, provides guidance in daily life, and brings us tidings of antiquity. For Jews, these tidings of antiquity are not merely a charm one finds in an antique shop, something quaint, sentimental, and useless. Rather, history is one of the key connectors that enables us to discover a shared life together. And history is not only about that which we once celebrated together. History, in its most profound sense, is the joint language of pain that forms the crucible of peoplehood. In simple human terms, we know that when strangers undergo a tragedy together, they form intense and unique bonds. Something life-changing happened in the presence of another, and both parties may be transformed forever as a result. Both need each other as reminder and witness. Tisha B'Av is precisely this reminder to us as Jews to take the time to mark difficulties, not escape from them. It is not a great sacrifice to ask people to fast once a year as a way of mourning together the persecutions, destructions, and calamities of our nation. Great, thank you, Shlomo. So just again, just kind of, this was meant to kind of warm us up a little bit. Uh, let me go ahead. There's a lot I'd like to say, but I'm going to try to discipline myself. Okay, and this is just a little bit about Jeremiah specifically, simply from the Jewish Study Bible, the, the English JPS Bible, uh, which gives us a little more commentary and context for these biblical passages. Uh, so maybe one more, Bob Singer, I don't know, would you read this? Sure. <clears throat> because Jeremiah is one of the key witnesses to the last years of the kingdom of Judah. He emerges as one of the major figures who grappled with the theological restoration of Jerusalem and the temple in the years following the end of the exile. In the course of his struggles to understand the tragic events of his lifetime, he tells the reader more about himself than any other prophet, including his anguish and empathy at the suffering of his people. His outrage at God for forcing him to speak such terrible words of judgment against his own nation, and his firm belief that the people of Israel would return to their land and rebuild Jerusalem once the period of punishment was over. Okay, thank you. All right, so now we have a we're sort of, you know, warming up our minds to this period of time, and as Barb was saying, I, I didn't put any text from this last parasha on my source sheet for today from Parashat Masai. But if we looked there, we would see many verses which describe the, the final geographical uh, movements of the people. And you read that with a sense of they're, they're getting ready to go in. In fact, there's even some language that says this is how you should behave once you go in. You're going to take possession of this land. It's, it's difficult for us to read knowing what we now know about how we have taken possession of the land and how many moral challenges that has put in front of us as a, as a people, and I'm speaking about modern Israel now. But it's just interesting to put, you know, the Torah and Jeremiah next to each other, which is what the tradition wants us to do 
last Shabbat and this coming Shabbat. Uh, le, uh, last Shabbat and this coming Shabbat, if I'm saying that correctly. Yes, this coming Shabbat, it'll be to read the end of the Torah, which has the people kind of right at the border, ready to go in. And Jeremiah, who, as we'll see in a second, starts out affirming his lineage in the land. So just that centrality of the land in the story of, of history. Okay, here's Jeremiah. And I've got about 17 verses. Yeah, I've got 17 verses here. I guess it's 18 technically, uh, which is the, the bulk of the first haftarah of rebuke. Depuranata, as it says in the Talmud. Okay, so let's just walk through this a little bit together. We start with Jeremiah identifying himself, his lineage, he's a Kohen, and he, uh, he comes from this particular territory, from Eretz Binyamin. So he's, he's very specific, locating himself in the land. And then he says in verse 2, here is his call to prophecy. It was during the, the time of King Josiah, uh, which we know was a time of um, upheaval, religious transformation. We think that Jeremiah had a role to play in that as, as a um, sort of whispering in the king's ear or maybe sometimes shouting in his ear to get him to rule in a certain way. And it was ultimately not successful with Josiah. But our tradition generally looks at Josiah with great admiration and uh, great appreciation. Okay, and then it tells us that uh, Jeremiah stayed on the job for quite a while. Okay, let's skip ahead now to verse 4. Vayhi devar Adonai elai lemor, God speaks to me, saying, he says, Baterem etzorcha baveten yedaticha uveterem tetze merechem even before you were born, God says, Hikdashticha, I consecrated you, Navi Legoyim. So as far as Jeremiah understands it, God is saying to him, I knew before you were born that you were going to rise to this particular role, and I chose you for it. And what does Jeremiah say in response? This should remind you of somebody famous in the Torah. Va Omar. Aha, Adonai Elohim, hine lo yadati daber ki na'ar anochi. I'm like a child. I don't speak. Who does that remind you of? Moses. Right. Vayomer Adonai Eli, al tomar na'ar anochi. God says, don't say that you're, you know, a child. Ki al kol asher eshlachacha telech ve'et kol asher atzavcha tedaber. Basically, you're going to be able to do this job. You're, whatever you, wherever you go, I will be with you. And wherever you're commanded to speak, you'll be able to speak. Don't be afraid. Okay, let's skip down to verse 9. Vayishlach Adonai et yado. So what an interesting anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic image of God. Is suddenly here God has a hand. Vayishlach Adonai et yado. Vayaga al pi, and God touched my mouth. Vayomer Adonai Eli, hine natati devarai b'ficha. I am putting my divine words in your mouth. And you remember that, again, just, uh, Moses comes to mind. Remember the Midrash about Moses and how, how it was that Moses came to be um, wounded in his mouth? The Midrash about him reaching for the, the hot coal? and touching it to his mouth as babies do. So here again, this image of God's hand uh, having a role in opening the mouth of the prophet. Um, okay, let's keep going. Re'e hifgadeticha. I have selected you, I have chosen you, I have appointed you. Hayom hazeh al hagoyim today over all nations va'al hamamlachot, and now here it's going to sound like Ecclesiastes to us. Lintosh velintots, ulehaavid velehaaros, 
livnot velintoa. Um, maybe can somebody just read this nine and ten to us in English? Bob, will you do that? The Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, herewith, I put my words into your mouth. See, I appoint you this day over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to skip down for a second just to look at a little bit of commentary a minute. Am I looking at the right one? Yes. Uh, okay, my commentary that I was looking for is not here. So um, just was interested in this language here. And notice that the, the command to Jeremiah in verse 10, I am pointing you today, al hagoyim va al hamam lachot, in other words, you're supposed to speak not just to the Jews, but to all the kingdoms, all the people within your, within your field. Okay, let's keep going now. Verse 11. Now there's like a little bit of a shift in the language, um, as, as if a, a different scene is going on now. Still Jeremiah and God interacting. Vayhi devar Adonai elai lemor. God says to me, saying, Ma ataroe Yirmiyahu. And remember, we looked at this exact passage a couple of weeks ago uh, in Parashat Pinchas. It came up when we were so focused on um, Aaron's almond uh, rod. We looked at this, so here it is now in its own its own you know context. Ma ataroe Yirmiyahu. What do you see, Jeremiah? Va Omar makel shaked ani roe. I see the branch of an almond tree. And remember all that looking we did about the, the almond, the, the, the promise of the almond blossom and the, the kind of a solemnity or um, a ominousness. I don't think that's a word, but I just made it up. This ominous quality, like there's a vigilance and ominousness to this uh, imagery of the almond tree. I, so he says, I see an almond blossom, makel, an almond branch. Vayomer Adonai Eli, hetev talirot. So God says to me, you looked well. Ki shoked ani al devari la'asoto. And again, we, this is exactly what we looked at a couple of weeks ago. God says, play, in a, you know, the author here is playing with shaked and shoked. So God says, look, there's an almond tree. That's to remind you that I am like the shakade, shokade. I'm going to watch. I'm going to be paying attention to see that my word is enacted. Okay, and you can see it all here in the English. You have seen right, hetev talir ot, for I am watchful to bring my word to pass. So as if God is saying to Jeremiah, I'm... I'm <laughs> Eyes on you, Jeremiah. I'm watching you to make sure you do what is being asked here so that the hopefully that the people will then respond to what's being prophesied. Okay, and now one of the most famous parts of Jeremiah coming up here, verse 13. Vahi devar Adonai Eli Shainit. Lay more. A second time God came to me to speak to me. Ma Taroe, same question. What do you see? Va Omar Sir Nafuach Aniroe. I see a pot that is Nafuach, like turning upside down or pouring forth, let's say. Upanav Mipne Tsafona, and its mouth is facing um, from the north. It means towards the south. It's it's as if it's gonna pour down on the south. Okay, and so this is where, this is a, to me a beautiful example of where we're being taught history here, but it's sort of um, encoded in some verses of poetic prophecy. So what history are we being taught here? Anybody want to jump in? The, the impending, well, 
if we're talking about from the north, we might be talking about the destruction of Israel by the Assyrians at a time when it looks like the Babylonians are getting ready to do what's happening to Judah. Yes. Okay. So, so just to, I, I guess if I was really good, I would have a map for us to look at, which I don't have. But if you can just in your mind's eye, picture, you know, more or less what you think of as the even the modern um, territory of the modern state of Israel, and then sort of to the northeast, <laughs> excuse me, the northeast a little bit, would have been the Assyrian Empire, several hundred years before Jeremiah would have been alive and speaking. And then by the time of Jeremiah, the Assyrians have been conquered by the Babylonians. Both empires are interested in having control of Judea, of Israel. The Assyrians, <laughs> you know, start out by conquering the northern part, which was Israel. And what's left now at the time of Jeremiah is just Judah, Judea, as we sometimes call it. And now the Babylonians are coming for Judea, which is what the 17th of Tammuz is about, and finally Tisha B'Av is about. So this is what Jeremiah is, is saying. He's saying, God is speaking to me and saying, here, Jeremiah, look and see. Like as if God could take, you know, Jeremiah's face in hand and say, look, and what do you see? And Jeremiah says, people, this is what I saw. I saw a boiling pot. A boiling pot is, what does that bring up for you? What do you think of with a boiling pot? And don't say good pasta. What, 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 I mean, I'm just curious. There's no way. Danger, right danger and destruction yeah, and a seeping water coming down and wiping everybody out in one fell swoop. Right. So I... And who else? Somebody else is going to say something here. Excellent, Audrey. Somebody else was just... Well, just something out of control. Mm-hmm. Great. So uh, a terrible force that's about to pour out, you know, kind of uncontrollable, and destruction is coming. And as Shlomo mentioned, you know, we have reason to believe that Jeremiah would have known the history of the Assyrian conquer, conquering of the northern country. There was no history book written, but we have reason to assume that by the time of Jeremiah, there already would have been this commitment to knowing something of national history. Go ahead, Audrey. It also seems to be this imagery of one where it's not like there's a fighting force coming down that people can rally against and fight the force. It's almost as if this is happening regardless of any kind of defense we would put up. And it's happening as a result, as we, you know, it's been said, because you know the people did not act well, they're bringing it upon themselves because they were not being, um, you know, religious or they were not following God's commandments, and this was brought upon them. So it's not like they can. You can't fight pouring water coming down on you. <laughs> you can fight, you know, a uh, an army. An army. This doesn't. But this is not describing necessarily an army. It's describing just devastation. Yes, an evil force is coming. Evil force, like a yeah. Yeah, which is good, sort of what I think, what, what I heard and what Gil was saying also. This is right. This isn't just a human army. Michael, go ahead. S somehow my, my map is backwards. This says that the, the danger is going to come from the north. Correct. Why is your map backwards? Well, I thought Judea was coming, the Babylonians were coming from the south. No, no, from the north. They were also coming from the north. Yeah, the Babylonians are, you know, what we would think of today as Iran, Iraq. Okay, so the Babylonians overcame the Assyrians, and they're coming from the north. Correct. Okay, I thought it was a separate group. No, no. I mean, it is a separate group, but it's it's they've conquered the Assyrians and taken over. I mean, it's obviously, I'm. this is like several hundred years of history being, you know, in two seconds. I just missed the last conquest. That's okay. That's okay. Might have been good to miss it. Uh, it would it would have been the Egyptians coming up from the south, and oftentimes, in, in, if you look at different parts of the Tanakh, even you can see you know places where the Egyptians and the Babylonians, or even the Egyptians and the Assyrians, would be fighting with each other for control of of this little precious place. All right, I'm just watching time, and I think I'd like to. Um, Like to just look with you. Yeah, let's just go on a little bit more here. Okay, verse fourteen. Um, maybe does somebody else want to comfortable to read in the Hebrew? 
Um, Shlomo, if you would, just get, nice to hear a different voice. Vayomer Adonai Eli, mitzafon tipatach hara'a, al kol yoshvei ha'aretz. Okay, so let's pause there. This is exactly what Michael was asking. In case you're not clear where this is coming from, mitzafon. And in case you're not clear what a boiling pot is referring to, it's ra'ah. It's this terror that's going to come at you on all the inhabitants of the land, kol yoshvei ha'aretz. Okay, great. Thank you, Shlomo. Keep going. Mm. So God is saying to Jeremiah, this, this is coming. This, this evil is this attack is about to come. Look at the English with me if, if the Hebrew is not obvious. Um, they shall come, each shall set up a throne before the gates of Jerusalem against its walls round about and against the towns of Judah. It's, it's going to come in stages. It's going to first come as a kind of uh, aggressive diplomacy, perhaps, and then broaden into a full-on attack, a siege, a destruction. Okay. Uh, um, just, just for time, I'm going to skip us ahead, okay? Um, so Shlomo, I'll come back to you in a second. Just look with me at this. Uh, this is what I, I did want to show you. So going back to the, the famous passage about the almond branch. Where are we? Here, verse 11. Okay, so again, this famous vision of Jeremiah. And now we're in Echa Rabbah, which is a Midrash collection um, commenting on Lamentations, the Book of Lamentations, which is also attributed to, to Jeremiah. We have no idea, but it's often attributed that way. And look at what it says here about the almond tree. It's so interesting. So now we have one of our sages, Rabbi Elazar, saying, what is the distinguishing mark of an almond tree? From the moment that it buds until it ripens is 21 days. How long is 21 days? It's three weeks. So again, just reinforcing the unique period of time that we're in here, three weeks, for the almond tree to fully open into its you know, complete shape and size. And of course, as Rabbi Elazar says, it marks the exact time that we're in, from the 17th of Tammuz into the 9th of Av. Okay, let's keep going now. So now we're in... Can I ask you a question before we go to the next yeah, chapter? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. The very, bring down a little bit. The very last sentence in that chapter, in God chapter. threatens Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Do not break down before them. Don't screw up, mm -hmm. lest I screw you up. Mm -hmm. So... Whether he likes it or not, he's under the thumb and he's going to do exactly what he's told. Mm -hmm. Yep. That doesn't seem right, but there it is. Yeah, there it is. I think it's very observant of you to point that out to us. Um, I was just looking at the Hebrew, sometimes that can give you a different clue. Uh, you will do what I command you. And it's sort of like the earlier the earlier passage about the almond branch when God uses that language of shakad into shokade. I'm watching you, Jeremiah. And if we if we you know got more into Jeremiah, we would see he doesn't want this job. He would like any other job but this job. It's a terrible job. Well Moses didn't want the job either, but Moses, Moses didn't want it either. did it without being threatened. But Joshua, uh, Joshua just had to had to be threatened. Yes, he's got to be told you're not you're not going to walk away from this. You're right. You're right. It's a it's a very ominous uh, ominous statement. Achitcha lifnehem. I will break you in front of them, like they're going to see you broken. Okay, it gets better though. We don't only have to stay in the bad place. Okay, so let's go to Jeremiah chapter 2. This would be the second of the three weeks. 
And this is where we're going to see some very famous language about the relationship between God and Israel as a relationship between two lovers who are heading to their chuppah. Okay, so let's go here. Uh, Shlomo, do you want to read some more in the Hebrew? Sure. Vayhidvar Adonai Eli Lemar. Haloch v'karata ba'aznei Yerushalayim Lemar. Ko'amar Adonai. Okay, hold on just a second. Just look at the beautiful language already here. So in verse 2, um, it's interesting. In the translation, they just give us, go proclaim to Jerusalem. But what does it say in the Hebrew? Haloch v'karata ba'oznei Yerushalayim. Uh, go and, you know, karata, proclaim or call out to, into the ears of Jerusalem. Like, go speak it right intimately into people's ears. They shouldn't miss this. So interesting. They, I don't know why they don't give you that in the English, because it's, it's powerful. It makes it even that much more intimate. It's not just Jeremiah with a bullhorn, you know, speaking into the courtyard. It's Jeremiah going up to Audrey, Michael, Shlomo, Bob, all of us, and speaking right into our ears. Okay, keep going, Shlomo, if you would. Ko amar adunai, zacharti lach chesed neuraich, avat klulotaich. Okay, let's see what this is saying now. Anybody recognize this? It's 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 sure. been it's harnessed into the uh, into the Yamim Noraim. It's in the It's also a great song. It's a great song. song. Right. Okay, well hold on. I might ask you to sing some of that. Um, I don't know it as a song, but I definitely know it as liturgy. So what is God saying here? Zacharti lach chesed nu'uraich. Zacharti, I remember, or maybe I took note of you, especially at the time of the chesed is like um, unconditional love or endless loving kindness that I knew at the time of your youth, when you were still young, before you had grown into a full nation with governors and leaders and kings and everything went wrong. When, when, when you... Lechtech, where are we? Ahavat kilulotaich, when you were like loving as a bride. You know, <laughs> I mean, well, I, so, so a few of us were just at a wedding this past weekend, so the imagery is very fresh in my mind. What, what happens at a wedding? You know, the couple is dressed in their finest, and all of us gather around the couple to witness and to sort of uh, lovingly support and sort of enforce the love between them. And so that then when they have to do the dishes together, they have something to remember about the essential love that they have for each other. That's what God is saying. That remember before we got into this whole mess together, you went wherever I told you to go. Go ahead, Gil. Isn't this disingenuous though? Because we've just finished reading numbers where people of Israel who are the ones who went into the land are still yes. pissing God off every five minutes. This is, yeah. they were past doing dishes. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's very important to um, to highlight that. Is this what God being either disingenuous or just being a little bit like romantic somehow and not being in touch with reality? Like, oh my yeah. God, don't you remember how horrible it was when we were trying to walk through the wilderness together? Um, yeah. I, I don't have a, um, I don't feel like I have a good answer for you, but it's a very important observation to make. Um, I think on some level, you know, wouldn't we all like to be able to go back to some visionary experience of love, even if that original love didn't embody the thing we think we're remembering? Um, I'm not sure about that, but thank you for mentioning it. So, okay, so Shlomo was right here. Zacharti la chesed neuraich, avat kilulotaich, kilulotaich, like kala, bride, the love, the love of your, you know, bridal moment. And then, Shlomo, would you go on here? I think you read this, but do that again. Lechtech acharai bamidbar, be'eretz lo zeru'ah. So, lechtech, so following after me, bamidbar, as Gil is saying, uh, well, <laughs> sort of following after me through the wilderness, Be'eretz lo zarua, in a land that was not yet seeded. In the English, they say a land not yet sown, which again is, 
you know, you were so faithful. You went after, you followed me even to a place that you didn't know what was going to happen there. You didn't know if anything was going to grow there. You, there was no established um, source of nourishment. You still went with me. That was a kind of love God seems to be saying, I wish we had now. Okay, Shlomo, would you keep going with verse 3 now? Kodesh Yisrael Adonai Reshit Tevuato Kol Ochlav Yeshamu Ra'a Kavo Alehem Neum Adonai Whoops, I didn't read that well. Kol Ochlav Yeshamu Ra'a Tavo Alehem Neum Adonai Okay. So Kodesh Yisrael Ladonai, Israel is sanctified to God. Um, same language we use in the wedding ceremony. The wedding ceremony. Hare ata mekudash li. You are yeah. sanctified to me. And then interesting how it says reshit tevuato. Israel is the first fruit of God. Reshit tevuato. Uh, you can hear the, the prayer for the state of Israel now. Avinu shabashamayim tzur Yisrael v'goalo barech et medinat Yisrael reshit tzmichat geulatenu, the first uh, tzemach, like the first little sapling uh, of our redemption. That's how we, so the, Jeremiah, I think, is being invoked there as well. Just wonderful to see how it shows up in different places. So here Israel is being called the first fruit of God's experiment with creation, let's say. And we could spend a whole long time coming at this as, you know, from a reconstructionist lens and saying, is this really what we want to say about our people? Um, I'm, I'm going to just put that in a parking lot for now. It's a good discussion, but maybe not for right this minute. Okay, and then to go on from there, not only are we... got to read the rest, the, rest, the rest of go that ahead. sentence. Go ahead, go ahead. In, in English, I mean. Yes, you know. I know. Yeah, we're coming. We're coming. Go ahead. Well, uh... Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it were held guilty. Correct. Disaster befell them. Right. So that does bring in both parts of that period of time in the desert, the good parts and the rebellious parts and the punishment and the swallow and the earth swallowing you and the plagues and the fire. And there's plenty to, that you didn't do right in those yes. days. Correct. But I guess I also understand this to mean any outside group that tries to take a bite out of Israel is going to suffer. Anybody that comes to try to eat from this first fruit is going to experience disaster. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's keep going just through this last uh, bit of section. So it starts out in chapter 2, you sort of think, okay, God is like saying, remember the marriage photo. It was a beautiful time for us. Why can't we? That's how I hear it. But then quickly says, but now things have gone awry. So let's look here. I wanted to get into verse 5. Where are we? Um, Ko, Ko yeah, but even just right here with the question. Can you go here, Shlomo? Ma matzu? Sure. Ma matzu avotechen bi avel ki rachaku me'alai. What did I do so wrong? God is saying to Israel, why did, why did you all start to abandon me? Not the original ancestors, but the, the ones at the time of Jeremiah. And what, what, is he, what does that mean, the abandonment? He's speaking about the incorrect practices. So um, as we, when we read the book of Kings, which would have paralleled this same time, and we see that King Josiah, who was on the throne at the, at least part of Jeremiah's career, was involved in a whole um, policy of cleaning out the temple and cleaning up the practices and sort of trying to bring the Jews, they, they were about to become Jews, um, back into correct ritual practice because they had become tainted with the practices of other religions, other surrounding religions, and, and at least our ancestors understood that must be the reason for the suffering we're about to undergo. 
as, at least as Jeremiah understands it in the way he's hearing it from God, the reason we are being made to suffer, it's because we abandoned God. As if God is saying right to Jeremiah, I don't know what, why are you over there sacrificing to Baal or to other gods? Okay, and let's go. Can we keep going a little bit more? Um, Velo amru aye adonai hamaale otanu me eretz mitzrayim. Hamolich otanu bamidbar be eretz arava beshucha. Be eretz tsia be tsalmadet. Be eretz lo avar ba ish. Lo yashab adam sham. And maybe just keep going. Let's just finish this. The aviat chem el eretz ha carmel. Ne echol pirya. The tuva. The tavau vat tamu et arzi. Um, just because this is the last section, could I ask somebody to read this, this like say verses six through seven in English? Maybe Audrey, would you? They never asked themselves, where is the Lord? Who brought us up from the land of Egypt? Who led us through the wilderness, a land of deserts and pits? a land of drought and darkness, a land no man had traversed, where no human being had dwelt. I brought you to this country of farmland to enjoy its fruit and its bounty, but you came and defiled my land. You made my possession abhorrent. La toeva, uh, 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 an abomination, we would say in English. Okay, so this is the pain that we're hearing through Jeremiah's mouth that God is expressing. I tried to, to bring you into a place that would nourish you, and you spurned me, basically. And so now look what you've created. Okay. I want to come bring us back now to close the hour, back to Erica Brown. Ah, this was the, this was the commentary that I was looking for before. OK, I'm going to let that go for now. So I asked Audrey um, to help me get hold of the specific teaching that Erica Brown gives in her book on the three weeks for today. And she's holding up the book for us. It's called In the Narrow Places. And that was what we read the introduction from. And then she goes on for every day of the three weeks to give a specific teaching. And so I wanted to just look with you just for a couple of minutes at the closing teaching that she gives. I'm sorry. It's our closing teaching for this hour. It's her teaching for this day, which we're marking as the 26th uh, of Tammuz and the 10th day of the three weeks. And for this, we need to hold on to that imagery, that bridal, that wedding imagery that we just saw in Jeremiah, uh, that you are, you Israel were like a bride to me and we had this beautiful love between us that has now been lost. So now um, I did pull this up. Hold on just a second. Mm. You? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Let me just screen share. Can people see this? It's a little bit small, I think. Um, Audrey, I know you also sent me a PDF, which I can't, I don't have it in my hand. So hang on, let me see if I can pull it up correctly. Just bear with me just a second. Hmm. Rachel, I just put a link to that page in Safari in the chat. Great, thank you. It's much easier to read. Okay, but I also have it much bigger now. Thanks okay. to Audrey who sent me a scan of it that is better. Let's see if this, oh, here, okay. All right, so hopefully this is much easier, yes, to see. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead. Oh, 
In the third chapter of Jeremiah, she goes on into the third chapter, another one of the Haftarot read in these weeks, we find the comparison of Israel's idolatry to adultery. One of the greatest unspoken fears we have in love and marriage is that of betrayal. We age and we worry that perhaps we are not as attractive or as interesting as we once were, or perhaps our spouse will load, load the dishwasher incorrectly for the 197th time, or say something idiotic to one of the neighbors and that will make us angry. Just pulling out a few examples from my own household. If the marriage grows stale, will he look elsewhere? Will she find real happiness with someone else, etc.? The Israelites' lack of faithfulness is contrasted to God's everlasting hope that they will one day return. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead here. Hang on. Here. So she now, Erica Brown, is now going to quote from Jonathan Sachs, who was one of her great teachers and certainly one that we have continued to turn to even you know, even after his death. The great covenantal relationships between God and mankind, between two people in marriage, between members of a community or citizens in a society exist because both parties recognize that it is not good for us to be alone. God cannot redeem the world without human participation. Humanity cannot redeem the world without recognition of the divine just going on for the, this last part here. In true love, not only are we willing to risk all for an uncertain future, we are willing to forgo our own emotional protection to take back that which is temporarily lost. In that rawness of vulnerability, we test the limits of compassion, as does God. And before we just read her last thing, She wants us to notice, uh, she wants us to mark this day, this 10th day of the three weeks as a time to try to begin to repair relationships or at least to acknowledge the brokenness of the relationship that we want to ultimately repair. I would say that when we get into the seven weeks of comfort, then we're in relationship repair par excellence. But she's offering us an opportunity to delve into it a little bit here, even during the three weeks. And so now just look with me at the very closing meditation she gives. This season of Jewish tragedy and betrayal is a time to review and renew flagging relationships. If you are in a marriage, list three things you can do right now to strengthen intimacy. And I would say, it doesn't matter if you're in a marriage. We all have relationships of all different kinds, um, which want our attention, our love, our forgiveness. No matter how long you have been in that relationship, whatever it is, or how well know, you know the other person, you can still find ways to enhance trust, to share kindnesses, and offer unexpected love. We repair what is broken with enduring love and trust. The Haftarah does not end that way during the three weeks. The Haftarah ends with rebuke in keeping with the season. And so I feel grateful to Erica Brown for offering us this landing place as we try to make our way through these weeks and through the coming challenges. So thank you all so much for tuning in and looking with me at this marvelous text. May it nourish us all, and may we continue to look for these places of healing. Everybody have a good rest of your week. I always felt that we should begin Tisha B'Av with mourning the way we do, but I think we should end it with a misibah. And the reason I think so is because Tisha B'Av got rid of the sacrificial cult and replaced it with learning, prayer, discussion, and everything that turned into rabbinic Judaism, which is the Judaism we have. Correct. So this year, let's have a Missy Bah yeah. at the end of Tisha B'Av.
Yeah, I have a, a, an old colleague who says we should have Tisha B'Av and then we should have Seudat Asara B'Av. Okay, great. And celebrate. Thank you, rabbis. Here we go. Yes. Amen. Okay, see you all soon, I hope. Thank Everybody you. stay well.